Well, thank you, Rebecca, very much. And ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, um, since you're going to start by making fun of my clothes, I'm going to take my jacket off. <laughs> now you can make fun of my body. Um, it's all right. It's the, uh, it's, the, it's the Schwarzkopf look. It's OK. It's, uh, it's called bulky chic. Um, if you're not, if you're not uh, bulky and rumpled, there's something wrong with you. It's, uh, Peter Schramm can now feel comfortable, now feel at home. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be with you. I'm very pleased to be at Ashland, and certainly very pleased to be back at Ashbrook uh, with so many friends. It's been, what, six, five years? I think since I've been to Ashbrook, it's too long, and it's wonderful to be here with you uh, on this spectacular day. And it's so nice of you to come inside on this spectacular day. And I'm surprised in the course of the two hours I've been here, someone hasn't already asked if we can hold this class outside, given how beautiful, uh, how beautiful it is. Um, I want to talk for a while, but then I welcome your, uh, your questions, uh, because I know the kind of work that goes on here. Um, I had the benefit of meeting with a group of students this morning. Uh, you've got a splendid uh, place here, and the work that is done is excellent. And uh, I want to encourage as much uh, exchange and debate and dialogue as we can. Uh, this is a very busy time of year for me. I'm on the road uh, a lot. Uh, I have been in California a great deal. I spent about uh, 11 days in California in September. Uh, there's a ballot initiative in California on school choice, uh, of which I am very supportive. Uh, so I have been out there uh, arguing for this, uh, for this initiative. Uh, at home, uh, I have uh, a wife and uh, two children. When I was drug czar, uh, I was able to refer to my wife as Zarling and to our two little boys as the Zardines. Um, and they are uh, ambivalent about my travel. Actually, they're not ambivalent about it. They don't like uh, all the travel. I was in uh, California uh, for these 11 days. And on one trip, uh, I was there on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I finished Saturday afternoon. I was scheduled to fly back to Washington on Sunday and fly back to California on Monday. I thought that was a little much. I was going to come home check in, have dinner, be with the family, fly back out on Monday. So I thought I'd call on Saturday to see if Elaine would approve my just staying on. Um, this was last month. True story. I called home. I got my four-year-old, Joseph, on the phone. I said, hi, Joseph. How are you? He said, fine. How's your brother? Fine. How's your mother? Fine. You know, these four-year-olds can be monosyllabic sometimes. <clears throat> Whatever I said, he said, fine. But we carried on a sort of father-son conversation for a few minutes. After five minutes, Joseph all of a sudden said more than one word. He said several. He said, who's calling, please? <laughs> and true, true. And I said, it's your daddy. Uh, tell mom I'm coming home tomorrow. I'll see you all, I'll see you all for dinner uh, tomorrow night. <laughs> those, are the, those are the perils of, of traveling, of being on the road. It's particularly perilous if you're one of a uh, sort like me, conservative Republican type who likes to talk about family values, because you can come home and be greeted by a wife who says, talking about family values again, dear? Yes, yes I have. Well, why don't you go upstairs and do a little retail with your two sons? And that's, uh, and that's fair enough. Uh, but um, I love my work. Uh, I love talking about uh, these things and writing about these things and discussing uh, these matters with uh, other citizens of the United States. And so I'm very pleased to be with you today to talk about the topic of Western civilization uh, and in defense of Western civilization. It might seem an odd thing uh, to even raise the question, why would one have to defend Western civilization, uh, given that it is and has done so much. But uh, when I was Secretary of Education in the United States, uh, I uh, found myself having to do this more than once. I came to be Secretary. Um, from being chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Um, as the chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, I presided over this agency where we dispensed grants to colleges and universities, professors uh, for research and study and conferences uh, in the humanities, the subjects of philosophy and history and literature uh, and art history. Uh, I got the job because when Ronald Reagan was elected president, they said he had to find uh, an academic uh, who uh, could run the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, who had supported him. And so they began a nationwide search for professors in the humanities who had voted for Ronald Reagan. And they found four or five of us. And we were all interviewed for the job, and I got, I got the nod. 
But I found a secretary of education that I had to go to a number of universities. I had to go to Harvard, and uh, at Harvard I was asked, why the West? Why defend the West? I went to Stanford, uh, because Stanford was at the time uh, considering dropping its required course in Western civilization. Um, they were thinking of getting rid of the course uh, or altering it so dramatically that it wouldn't rec be recognizable. Uh, and I uh, was asked to go out and uh, speak about it. Uh, I asked if I could uh, do so and, and debate the president of the university. That didn't quite work out, but we later got to debate it on, on television. But here I was, the Secretary of Education of the United States of America, uh, traveling all the way across the country uh, to defend Western civilization uh, at an institution of higher learning, indeed one of the premier institutions of higher learning uh, in our day. Uh, rather odd, uh, wouldn't, you, uh, wouldn't you say? Um, when I got there, I said, seems to me there's a lot to be said for Western civilization. Um, and essentially, I can sum up my remarks to you today by telling you what I said then. I said, yeah, there are a lot of blots on our record, a lot of errors, a lot of sins, a lot of omissions, a lot of things we have done wrong, both in the West and uh, generally, and in America particularly. Um, but I said I'd say two things about that. One, uh, when we make mistakes here in this country, in this society, uh, when we do things that are embarrassing uh, or reprehensible, uh, our citizens know about it. Uh, they read about it in the newspaper. Uh, they see it uh, in, telev in television. So am I embarrassed to speak for less than a perfect democracy? Uh, no, I am not. Um, second, uh, despite all the errors and blunders and sins, I think the record of Western civilization is pretty good. It's invented a number of ideas, come up with a number of ideas, which have become uh, uh, the currency of the world uh, in terms of uh, practices, uh, institutions, uh, rights, uh, and the like. Um, jump in anywhere you want. Uh, the rule of law, uh, the idea of individual conscience, uh, freedom of the press, uh, freedom of speech, uh, the idea of merit, uh, color blindness, um, educational achievement, free enterprise, capitalism, uh, freedom uh, of exchange and barter. These are just a few uh, of the things uh, that we hold dear. Uh, equality and liberty, uh, perhaps the two greatest ideas ever struck off uh, by the mind uh, of man. As I said uh, at a lecture at the University of Iowa uh, last year, uh, it made a great deal of difference, it made a great deal of difference uh, that we uh, in the West uh, tended to go uh, with those ideas of liberty uh, and equality uh, and others in other parts of the world went with different ideas. It's made a great difference to the lives of people. Indeed, today, uh, ideas from Western civilization uh, are the currency of the world. UN charters, UN protections, uh, UN resolutions uh, are the language uh, of lawyers uh, and jurisprudence and philosophers uh, from the West. Uh, Mr. Adid, when he held his press conference uh, in Mogadishu, uh, was there in a pair of slacks and a striped shirt and a tie. Western attire with CNN uh, playing in the background. And if you go through his remarks, uh, you will see a distillation of about 2,000 years of Western civilization, at least in the words and languages and concepts he evokes. Fairness and individual rights, and the right to do things peaceably. Whether he was telling the truth or not is something else. But it is the language one uses in order to justify one's position. The language of morality and in international affairs, uh, the language of justification is largely that. Uh, of the West. Again, errors, mistakes, sins, blots, many of them, but I think more than overbalanced by so many important contributions and advancements. To me, the issue is not so much uh, should we defend uh, the West and is the West worth defending. It seems to me the course of human history uh, makes clear uh, that it is uh, worth defending. Uh, the question is, uh, for me, can we hold on uh, to Western civilization? More particularly, can we hold on uh, to American civilization? Uh, perhaps more particularly than that, can we hold on and strengthen the critical institutions in American life uh, to keep this country uh, from going in a direction uh, that we would all uh, regret? I have to tell you, there are days I wake up and I'm very worried uh, and concerned about this because I think the direction of our country, by many indications, uh, is not good. Earlier this year, uh, I released a report uh, called An Index of Leading Cultural Indicators, and it was an attempt to measure the behavioral and moral and social condition of American society. You're all familiar with the Index of Leading Economic Indicators. Uh, this is the Index of Leading Cultural Indicators. And we found some very interesting things. We found, for example, that there's been a 560% increase in violent crime in this country. 
Uh, we found that over the last uh, 25 years, there's been a 90-point decline in the SAT scores uh, in this country. Uh, we have found uh, that there's been a dramatic, a dramatic increase in child abuse in this country, even a dramatic increase in suicide among the young uh, in the United States. Uh, this, in the same period of time, when we were bringing about an economic miracle, uh, the likes of which the world has never seen, uh, and uh, during the same period of time in which we were winning that long twilight struggle against communism and establishing ourselves as the single, truly the single, military and moral power uh, of uh, this world. But at the time those things were going on, we were losing ground in many ways at home. If we were to just focus, and there are lots of areas we could look at, but if we were to just focus on crime and education and the family and look at those three institutions or practices in the United States, I think we would have some cause uh, for concern. One of the great institutions of the West is the idea of the rule of law. Do we have the rule of law in our criminal law today? I think we have one a good deal less than what we had 30 years ago. I'm not just talking about this recent verdict uh, in Los Angeles, which puzzled me uh, and puzzled so many other uh, people. I'm talking about the general disregard uh, for law and lawfulness uh, in our society, particularly in our cities. Let me give you some numbers. In 1960, if you committed a violent crime, the odds that you would go or be captured, caught, convicted, and go to jail were about 50 percent. You had a 50 percent chance. Today, if you commit a violent crime, the odds that you will go to prison are 10 percent. That's a radical change uh, in 30 years. And don't think that the people who are interested in committing crimes don't know it, because they do know it, and it encourages more crime uh, to be committed. Happily, lately, there's been a bipartisan outcry about this. Happily, lately, even Jesse Jackson has decided to speak out about it and to talk about the dangers of crime in the inner city and how, and he has said with very clear uh, uh, and unusual candor, uh, what the facts of life are in crime in the inner city, particularly the numbers of black-on-black -black crimes uh, in, those, uh, in those communities uh, and neighborhoods. But it is fair to say that there are communities in America which are de facto illegal, places where illegality reigns, illegality rules, and the rule of law does not obtain. Just the past Wednesday, I had the opportunity to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and Senator Biden's committee, sometimes known as the Anita Hill Clarence Thomas Committee. That's how it got famous. Uh, but that's the major committee on the, uh, on the Hill in terms of law, uh, criminal law, and, uh, and drugs. Uh, and we talked uh, at great length about this about the fact uh, that there are communities in America where the rule of law simply does not obtain, where the Bloods and the Crips rule the streets, uh, and where uh, law-abiding citizens live in fear and terror. That is a loss of civilization. That is de-civilization. That is not Western civilization. Uh, that is its opposite. In the second area, crime. In the second area, excuse me, education. Uh, although uh, the situation, I think, is not nearly as perilous and dangerous to life and limb as in crime, it's certainly one uh, that deserves our attention. We are spending more money today on education than we ever have, and our performance in our schools is still not what it should be. One of the bright sides of American education is higher education. So many of our students from high school go on to higher education, but we must be candid even there and, and point out that an awful lot of what we do in higher education is remedial education. An awful lot of the work in the first two years of college is work that should be done during the high school years. In every international comparison, our students, our students come in last or next to last or next to next to last in the industrialized world. We just had a recent international assessment of mathematics for 13 year olds, and our kids came in 13th out of 13. Uh, 13 nations were tested. Our kids came in 13th out of 13 in knowledge of math. South Korean young people came in first. But there was an additional question, which was, how do you feel about your knowledge of math? We came in first on that one. More American students felt good about their knowledge of math than did kids from any other country. We knew less and felt better about it than did the kids from any other country. Guess who came in last in their self-assessment of how much math they knew? The South Koreans. They knew how little they didn't know. They knew how much they knew and how much they didn't know and rated themselves uh, at the bottom. It's rather like we asked the people taking the test, what do you know? And they said, not much. And we said, how do you feel about it? And they said, cool, fine, I'm okay. <clears throat> Hope you are. We need to do better than that. 
we have taught these young people to feel good about themselves. If we can do that, perhaps we can teach them algebra. We need, we need to be doing a whole lot better than that. Remember, the dramatic decline in the SAT scores that took place from 1963 to 1978 was not a decline at the bottom. It was not a decline of the kids from the low socioeconomic levels. Those scores actually went up. It was a decline at the top. It was a decline in the best of our students, the best and the brightest of our students. The absolute numbers, the total number of kids scoring above 700 on the SAT scores was cut in half from 1963 to 1978. Thanks to curricular nonsense, thanks to fads and, and uh, 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 policies that were not thought through, uh, we destroyed um, the uh, uh, upward going uh, arc of educational achievement that we had seen uh, up to that time. That's a problem uh, and one we need to address. But be clear, there are serious problems uh, at the other end because although at the lower levels of the socioeconomic spectrum, the kids who are taking those tests are doing better, those kids who are staying in school, we still have areas in this country where an awful lot of students are not in school. If you take the 12 major urban centers of this country, obviously things are, are the worst there in almost all categories, but you will see dropout rates of 40 and 50 percent. We cannot allow this to happen. We cannot allow this to continue. Education is a serious matter. Uh, it's a matter we ignore at our peril. We cannot, it cannot be argued that we ignore it in terms of our financing of it, uh, that we spend almost $400 billion a year on this in this country on education. We need to be getting more uh, for our buck. The final uh, category I want to talk about, and perhaps uh, the one that in the end, at the end of the day, uh, has the greatest consequence uh, on our life uh, with each other and perhaps uh, on, indeed on our civilization, uh, is that institution which we regard as the central uh, American uh, institution uh, and perhaps uh, the central institution of all societies and all civilizations, and that is the family, the single most important institution uh, in our life. Uh, Michael Novak, my friend and colleague, calls the family uh, the first, best, and original department of health, education, and welfare. Uh, and indeed, he's right. Uh, he argues, and I believe he's right, that where families don't work, uh, we should try to do what we can uh, from the private side and sometimes even from the public side to compensate for that family. But it's very difficult to make up and to compensate for families. Uh, it's rather like substituting artificial hearts for real ones. We should try if that's our only alternative, but we should try to hold on to that real heart uh, for as long uh, as we possibly can. What is it I want to tell you? I do not want to tell you uh, a nostalgic story about Ozzie and Harriet though I think it's probably better to have a high regard for Ozzie and Harriet than for Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, and that's a debate in the culture uh, which we've been having for about 25 years. And I think <clears throat> you could summarize uh, a lot of our problems by pointing out that a lot of people saw more, more merit in the story of Bonnie and Clyde than the story of Ozzie and Harriet. But that aside, <clears throat> I don't want to hold that up uh, as, the, uh, as the typical American family. It's not the family I came from. Uh, my parents were divorced. Uh, my brother and I were raised by a single mother, and she found it very difficult because, as she said, two boys getting bigger in all ways all the time uh, were harder and harder for her to control. Well, we have nothing short of family dissolution going on in this country right now. And I say this not again to suggest, you know, that we should all be an ideal family so that we all come from ideal families. I don't suggest that, and I don't believe that. The better the family, obviously, the better the circumstance. Simply to point out that if we do not have families, if we do not have functioning families, it's very hard to know what we are going to substitute for them in order to bring the next generation to, if I may use the word again, civilization. How do we bring that next generation forward? We have been conducting an unwitting social experiment in this country for the last 25 years, which is having children and not raising them. And we are now shocked to find out what is occurring. There can be no shock about what is occurring. It was eminently predictable. And I, my hat is off to Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Democrat from New York, of predicting it, who said any society which has children, particularly males, and does not raise those males to standards of behavior and expectation, which does not have those young males around older males who will socialize them to proper standards of self-control and self-discipline, is asking for trouble and is going to get it, and when it gets it, uh, will richly deserve it. That's the experiment we've been carrying on for 25 years, and the results are in. Let me give you what I think are perhaps the most important numbers uh, in the index of leading cultural indicators 
and perhaps the most important numbers about the future of our society. They are these. In 1960, in 1960, the out-of-wedlock birth rate for white children in this country was 2%. In 1990, the out-of-wedlock birth rate for white children is 21%. That's quite a jump. That's quite an increase. That's quite a lot of kids. In 1960, the out-of-wedlock birth rate for black children in this country was 20%. 20%. In 1990, the out-of-wedlock birth rate for those children, black children, is 67%. At a hearing on Capitol Hill earlier this week, it was projected that if things keep going the way they're going, by the year 2000, we will have a 40% out-of-wedlock birth rate uh, for white children and an 80% out-of-wedlock birth rate uh, for black children. Can you have a baby out of wedlock and make a good baby out of it? Of course you can. There are people who do it all the time. There are mothers who do it all the time. But it's harder. It's harder. It's fighting uphill. It's harder in this climate. Economically, it's harder in this climate culturally. It's harder with what's on TV and what's in the movies and what's going on in the neighborhood in the 7-Eleven. It's harder, it's harder, it's harder. There's all the more reason for more adults to be involved in the raising of children, but the numbers just aren't there. That is the critical institution and I believe the critical challenge before us and the one, and the one least accessible to public policy and the one that government can probably do the least about. I am not here today calling for a Department of Family Affairs. God forbid that I should do that. I'm not here calling for some nanny, some general nanny, uh, to take over uh, the situation uh, in Washington uh, and to be uh, the family person uh, for every family in America. It cannot be done by government. Government cannot raise children uh, in, that, uh, in that way. So my point about the family, it's not so much that it's always a warm and fuzzy and glowing thing, so much as it is a necessity of a civilized society. You must have it. We have not, and no other society has figured out a way to bring the next generation along to some kind of reasonable stability, to some level of aspiration, to some level of hope and stability uh, and enterprise uh, without, uh, without family. Let me just conclude uh, by saying this. I suspect, at bottom, what is involved here is a shift, uh, not so much in government power, government responsibility, or in policy on one level or another. I expect the shift is much deeper and much more fundamental. I expect at the end of the day, this is a shift in our values. I think it has a great deal to do with the spiritual axis of life, a spiritual axis, A-X-I-S, is a phrase of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And what he has said is that in America, the spiritual axis of life has grown dimmer. It is, whether one likes it or not, a fact that an animating principle and set of ideas and set of values and beliefs uh, for the American people and the American civilization has been the strength and vibrancy of our religious tradition. That is a tradition that seems to me we ignore at our peril. Because as it is difficult to find a good substitute for the family, I would argue it is equally difficult, perhaps more difficult, to find the governmental or public policy or secular substitute for a vibrant and strong religious tradition. So I would suggest, as we look in the area of public policy, as we look in the area of governance and issues for the next few years, we consider all of the important institutions in American society that are engaged in bringing the next generation to maturity, what we usually call the character-forming institutions. But we look especially at the three which have specific responsibility there, the families, the churches, and the schools. Our salvation lies there, not in Washington and not in Columbus. It will be, if it is to come to pass, that we do renew this society and civilization, and I believe we will, because despite uh, what I'm saying, I see some hopeful signs out there. It will be because those institutions are strengthened, those institutions of family, church, and school uh, above all. Thank you very much and welcome your comments. <laughs> right, questions. What are the positive signs I see? Please, please say some quickly. Uh, and uh, and uh, 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 did we find any, any positive evidence, uh, positive signs in the index leading cultural indicators? Uh, not too many uh, positive ones. It looks as if some trends have bottomed out. Uh, the divorce level, for example, seems to have, uh, seems to have leveled off. Um, it's leveled off at a level that's pretty high, but it seems to have leveled off. But there's a funny thing about these, about the, about single, the single family business. 
we have now, for the first time in American civilization, American history, reached the point where if you look at children who are living with their moms only, and it's almost always moms, we shouldn't even say single parents, because <coughs> whatever, uh, wherever we look, it's almost always the moms. Uh, and we can, you know, criticize and carp and find fault with the moms here. But notice the moms are there. The fathers are nowhere to be seen. They're just not in the picture. Um, uh, they, are, they are hit and run. They are gone on, in these statistics. But for the first time in American society, uh, in American history, if you look at children living with their moms, half of them are there because of divorce. Half of them are there because they never had a father. That is, never formed families now constitute 50% of the single parent families. And that's a very important and I think very, very parlous trend, very dangerous trend. Um, one can argue back and forth a lot, but I think, you, I think most people would say on balance as a social trend, um, a divorce is better than the never formed. Uh, at least in more of those cases, people are going to go through some uh, rituals that will require them to pay some degree of attention. You're going to get at least a chance of uh, paternal support and involvement that you don't have in the other. Uh, in the other situations. But, yes, I mean, to every one of these, to every one of these uh, uh, facts and trends, uh, there are at least counterexamples. I mean, uh, <coughs> there are communities that have fought back successfully against crime uh, and drugs. Uh, Wall Street Journal today is a front page story about a woman uh, who is uh, fighting her own fight uh, in the streets of uh, Van Nuys, California, and apparently doing very well. Uh, let's, let's take a real hard one. Uh, because people say, is it possible to prevail uh, on this issue of drug use and crime? Uh, and some people think it isn't. Uh, well, in fact, it is. When people ask me, how are we doing as a country in the war against drugs, the overall figures are these. We're winning. We're, we're winning handily the war against casual drug use. Those numbers are way, way down. Addictive drug use is holding pretty steady, holding pretty, pretty solid at its numbers for obvious reasons. It's harder uh, to crack that habit, excuse the pun, than, uh, uh, than, uh, uh, than the casual use. But Charleston, South Carolina, uh, the level of, of crime and uh, criminal uh, drug activity in Charleston, South Carolina is uh, today uh, what it was in the early 1950s. It shot up in the 70s and 80s, but it's back to the level of the 50s. Why? Very good mayor, Democrat, Joe Riley. Uh, try to give credit when it's due. Uh, <laughs> uh, Reuben Greenberg. Uh, chief of police, probably the major reason. Reuben Greenberg is the black Orthodox Jew police chief of Charleston, South Carolina. You know, only in America. Only in America. It's America. <laughs> and there he is uh, out there doing his job. He is the most conscientious police chief I have ever seen. Uh, you might have seen a profile of him on 60 Minutes. Um, that came to be because several of us knew about Greenberg and praised him. All of us who praised him at that time were conservatives. So 60 Minutes decided it was going to take this guy down a peg since he was loved so much by conservatives. They went down there and they found it to be true, so they did a glowing profile of him. That's the way they play the game. Anyway, uh, that's all right. I got him a lot of publicity. The most conscientious and best police chief I ever saw. Uh, he ticketed himself once. He pulled himself over. I, um, <laughs> when I heard that story, I thought of that old uh, Ed Sullivan routine with senior ventures, you know? All right, all right, get over it. Who, me? Yeah, you. Anyway, same person talking to himself. Anyway, um, he went into public housing. He said, I'm going to clean up public housing. I will protect you in public housing, he said, if you will agree to live by certain conditions. No use of drugs. You don't house anybody who uses drugs. You don't house anybody who sells drugs. You abide by those rules, I'll protect you. First week in the job, there was a mom and her three kids and a drug dealer in their apartment using it as a, uh, as a place to do his, to his dealing. Ruben Greenberg said, by the rules the, uh, we adopted, lady, you are evicted. You and your three children are evicted. You know what happened, seeing television cameras, the babies in the street with the mom. And uh, people said, uh, won't you reconsider? And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to decide. This is, this is America. It's do-it-yourself time. <clears throat> he went back into the public housing project, gathered the tenants together, and said, what do you want? What kind of society do you want? You decide. Does she stay or does she go? She said, you are deciding the future of your community in doing this. They said, she goes. And so she went, and the place is clean. She went down the road and moved somewhere else <clears throat> uh, into another project. But that city is clean. Uh, I know it's clean because uh, I went there, 60 Minutes went there. More importantly, the Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina went there. And if the Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina says that South Carolina is doing something right, 
it's doing something right. Believe me, that's the, that's that regional rivalry. Now that is uh, that is one of the toughest problems one can face in American society today. A port city. There's a lot of poverty in Charleston, uh, and they uh, and they turned it around. In terms of families, we all know counterexamples to the trends I'm talking about. We all know about glowing examples to that. Not far from here is one of my heroes, a guy named Charles Ballard, who works in Cleveland. I don't know if any of you know him. But Charles Ballard is now responsible, working in the community of Cleveland, for getting 500 men to own up to their fatherhood. He has brought 500 men out of oblivion to come forward to say, I am the father of that child, and to propose marriage to the mother of those children. And Charles Ballard helps them find jobs. That is an American hero. Um, he does it uh, through his church. He's a man of deep spiritual belief. That uh, is truly uh, extraordinary, but it can happen. Um, in education, there are good schools in this country. There are good public schools. There are good private schools. Uh, there are miracles taking place uh, against uh, terrible odds every day. Um, I have been, I went to Chicago uh, when I was Secretary of Education, and I saw American education at its worst. I said, I said the uh, second trip I was in Chicago, I said, this is the worst school system in the United States of America. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, that's a perfectly clear sentence. This is the worst school system in the United States of America. <laughs> and they said, no, back it up. I said, OK, you spend $4,000 per child per year, 1986. For that, you get a 50% dropout rate. Of the kids who remain in school, 50% of them score in the bottom 1% of the country. I said, this is a disaster. This is educational meltdown. They said, well, uh, uh, it's not really that bad. I said, yeah, it really is that bad. Uh, they said, no, it's, it's more like 48% dropout rate. And, <laughs> and we went back and forth, and the guy finally got furious at me. He said, listen, Mr. Bennett, you know, I respect you, blah, 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 blah. But we are not the worst school system in the country, he said. Detroit is the worst school system in the country. <laughs> I said, good for you. You know, way to stand up for your rights here. Uh, <laughs> do not be guilty of low aspirations, you know. It's like the Cleveland Indians. We're not the worst team in baseball. There's a team worse than us. That's the old days. That's the old days. I, you remember, never mind. I'm a Cincinnati Reds fan. I should, full disclosure. Anyway, I, never mind, never mind. Um, yeah, we, we, I, I don't want to digress. Ms. Mrs. Frankfurter, Justice Frankfurter's wife, said that he used to, Justice Frankfurter used to make two mistakes when he was speaking. He used to digress from his text, and then he would return to it. So which is. <laughs> Uh, which, which is worse. But, but there in Chicago, you know, I, I went to the LaSalle Language Academy, public school, uh, wonderful school. Kids were learning like crazy, wearing uniforms, lots of languages, lots of math, lots of history, doing a great job. Great principal, great teachers, uh, parental involvement. Um, it was a school of choice. Uh, they picked the principal out to run it because they thought she was real good, and she, they let her hire her own team. But they wouldn't generalize that throughout the system because they didn't know if they had enough principals to do that because a lot of the teachers wouldn't be hired if principals had their choice. And parents wouldn't go to a lot of schools. Uh, so, you know, you have, examples, uh, you have examples pro and con. We need, I think, in looking at the large numbers and in looking at the uh, general trends, uh, to understand these things are not inevitable, that the capacity of this country for self-renewal is extraordinary. Uh, that a country that has undertaken and overcome fascism, communism, a Great Depression, all sorts of other problems, Nazism, can win against these problems too. But it's to understand that this one's a little different in its nature. Um, if you read, in my view, the really smart people like Solzhenitsyn, Walker Percy, not uh, political scientists who are very smart too, but the novelists who are smart in a different way. The novelists and the poets, what they say about American society. You get a somewhat different picture, maybe, a, maybe at times a little deeper picture. John Updike said, the fact that we're living well as a society doesn't make us feel better when we have some sense that we're not living as nobly as we used to, that life isn't as noble as it used to be in moral terms. And people like Percy and Solzhenitsyn talk about weariness, indifference, cynicism, um, uh, envy, self-promotion, uh, and that we've drifted uh, from those uh, values. If you come to the conclusion that it's a problem of values or virtues, um, then uh, the levers for change uh, are very different than if you come to a conclusion that it's lack of a national policy on health care or lack of a national policy on something else. 
but I would, I would argue for part of this problem, it is not so hard to figure out what to do. I mean, take the crime part. Uh, I don't think that's hard. Um, I think you have to build the prisons. I think you have to have more cops on the street. And the ratio of cops to crimes has decreased dramatically. You have to have more court personnel, and you have to have real sentences. I mean, there is a sickening feeling in the, in the, in the heart of the American people when they read these stories out of Miami about these 15-year-old kids being arrested for these, for these crimes and finding out the 15-year-old kid has 12 prior arrests. Um, this is a juvenile justice system that was created for, to take care of truancy uh, and has now got to deal with something a lot more serious. But conceptually, it's not hard to do. It's a matter of political will. Same educationally. I mean, to me, you, you have broad and deep and wide educational choice, and you have standards, and you have accountability. And you publish scores. You publish scores by, di by school district and by school. And you let parents pick their schools. And you create some measure of competition. And you let teachers start their own schools. And you have national standards. Now, some of my conservative friends worry about that. I agree it's something worth worrying about. But you have national standards in math and reading. And you don't let people go to college until they're basically competent with high school skills. And you talk to teachers today. I've talked to a lot of teachers who tell me, they say to students, you better work hard or you won't get into college. Students laugh at them. They know they're going to college. Somebody will take them. Somebody will take them. You know, if they're, if they're barely alive, somebody will take them. Because as there's a tuition which somebody, probably somebody else is going to pay for. And that's a problem. Look, I'm as proud as I can be. We have the greatest system of higher education in the world. I just want all of it to be higher education. I don't think we should call higher education if it's really secondary education. You ask me a question, I'm giving you another speech, please. <coughs> Uh, to what degree do I think things can be improved by reforming the welfare system? Again, I think this is a matter everybody agrees on. Uh, President Clinton has said he will end welfare as we know it. Uh, we're waiting. We're waiting. And, and we'll see if he does it. I think it's, I think it's very, uh, very important uh, because I think it teaches so many bad lessons. You know, nobody hates the welfare system more than the people who are on it. This was a great insight I had in going around to the, to the uh, uh, public housing projects in the country in the course of my work as drugs are. People hate welfare. They hate the system. They feel like they're dependents. They, they hate the bureaucracies they have to deal with. Uh, 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 some of them are just addicted to it. They're just hooked on it. Uh, but this is something you're doing which uh, is actually going to make a lot of people feel better about themselves who, uh, uh, who are the current recipients of it. End it as we know it. The analyses have been done over and over again. I don't think this is a hard one to do conceptually. It's just hard to do politically. Uh, for that, we need, as Pericles said, the, few, the, the, uh, uh, the secret of democracy is courage. Uh, and you just, have to go out, uh, you just have to go out and do it. Because the numbers are getting worse and worse. Um, in 1965, 3.5% of our children were on welfare. So we adopted the war on poverty, massive spending on welfare programs. Today, 13% of our children are on welfare. <clears throat> we set up a program to do away with it, and we made it bigger. Now, conservatives have a rule of thumb. If you subsidize it, you get more of it. You know, if you put money out there for it, you're going to get more of it. In this case, I think it turned out to be true. But it's not just the money. If it had worked, I don't think I would have mind spending the money. But it hasn't worked. And this is, what, this is what makes many of us angry. Really don't mind spending some money to help people, provided it helps people. But I am convinced much of the money we have spent has made things worse. I will tell you, I know this is a controversial area, <clears throat> when I was at the Department of Education and examined the programs in bilingual education, I decided this was money that was making things worse and not better. These were programs which were intended by legislation to get kids fl to become fluent in the English language, help children become fluent in English for their sake. And what we found, we studied it, is that the more bilingual education money that went to a district, the longer the kids um, stayed in their native language and didn't learn English. Well, it was, it was having, it was having uh, the exact opposite effect, and there, I'm, I'm afraid there's a fair amount of that uh, in our system, and welfare is a prime example. The main thing that's wrong with welfare is, in many ways, the main thing that's wrong with our bad schools. Uh, they, they kill the spirit. They destroy the spirit of people. They destroy their character. Uh, it's the same argument I have against drugs. Yes, it's a medical problem. Yes, it leads to crime. The main problem uh, is it destroys the character needed in a free society. It, it creates, as Jefferson said, the habit of dependence. And the habit of dependence begets servitude. And that's what you've got in a lot of our communities, servitude. Servitude, servitude to the bureaucratic state. Yeah, television and its impact, impact television on um, violence. Um, as I said this morning to the students, to me, the worst shows on television are not the violent shows. The worst shows on television are the 
the parade of the parade of weird whiners on the talk shows. That to me is the worst. Uh, people, one endless. One endless progression of, of people who, have, who are victims. And the problem is it really doesn't separate out the real victims from people who imagine that they are victims. And instead of people who are victims of disease, of crippling uh, disease and, and birth defects or hurricanes and natural disasters, you have all sorts of, in my view, imagined uh, uh, offenses that people take. And you have one that's a competition in many of these shows uh, to see what, can, what, can, what one can find uh, that is uh, stranger, more bizarre, uh, and more shocking and titillating to the audience. The problem is we, people begin to think this is somewhat normal in American society. They pick up the habits of victimization and complaining, uh, and thus you have the whining, uh, the whining of America. Uh, this is the difficulty for me. I don't, I, don't, I don't encourage the violence. I deplore the violence. I think the violence is awful. It tells us how, sh how shallow and how I think how wrongheaded a lot of the people who make these things are. Um, they are peddling trash, and they know it. And they don't have to peddle trash. As, as our, I think our foremost authority on TV and the movies, Michael Medved, uh, has courageously pointed out, uh, PG movies uh, out, uh, uh, outdraw our movies three to one in America. Three to one. Uh, the argument that you have to make our movies to bring in customers is, uh, is phony. Aladdin you know, brought, in, brought in 10 times the audience of, uh, of 10 R-rated movies. Uh, so you, know, you don't have to do it this way. In terms of responsibility, yeah, I think people who make these trashy movies should be held accountable. I do not think the government should regulate because the government will get it wrong. It will make it worse. It will somehow make it worse. It's just like it's regulating of the cable rates to bring them down, and the cable rates are higher uh, since, uh, since they did that. Um, secondly, the Attorney General of the United States should not, in my view, be spending a lot of time on this issue. She should be spending a lot of time uh, on crime, uh, on, on people shooting each other and making sure that the people who shoot uh, go to jail. The final responsibility, I think, on this is individual. If people are old enough, um, as, uh, as Rush Limbaugh said the other day, you know, what kind of really stupid 18-year-old goes out and lies in the middle of a superhighway? Are we going to blame that on this stupid, uh, on this stupid movie? Uh, but uh, for younger children, parents, parents, parents. That's what we have parents for. That's what we invented parents for. It's not because we all sit around ogling at each other. It's because you've got a job to do. Um, I, you know, I'm, I was a former Secretary of Education. My wife's a former elementary school teacher. We have two children. A lot of people in this audience have a lot more children than that. I'll tell you, we're with those two boys, two boys and us. It's an even fight, you know? We're bigger, we're smarter, we're stronger, we have more resources, we control everything. It's an even fight. Be <laughs> Because they're willful, you know, they're willful. And because I don't know what it is, in Adam's fall we sinned all, I don't know what it is, but they get into trouble. They have this way of getting themselves into trouble, getting themselves into scraps and scrapes and difficulties. And you gotta be there, you know, you just simply, uh, you simply gotta be there. Um, we, uh, with some trepidation, you know, our, our guys were little, nine and four, said about a year and a half ago, we're just, we were, we were monitoring TV pretty closely. So we said, uh, Elaine and I went out to dinner, we said, let's just, let's just cut it off completely during the week, just nothing during the week, and then a couple hours on Saturday, and uh, maybe an hour on Sunday. And we said, all right, now we gotta back each other up, you know? <laughs> and we told the boys, and uh, uh, we told the boys, it's a piece of cake, it was, was no problem. It was almost as if they were relieved, you know? They want you to draw lines, they want limits, they, they expect it of you, and that's what, uh, that's what you're there to do. It wasn't the greatest act of heroism in Western civilization, but it is, it is a, lot, a lot of small acts of heroism uh, in Western civilization. If, you, if we do spend 13 years of our life watching this stuff, uh, which is what a lot of Americans do on average, um, you know, it's gonna make a difference. Look, it, the, the, the argument that it doesn't have any impact cannot be true. These people spend millions of dollars to buy advertising time to influence our behavior. If, if, they, if, if what you see on TV does not influence your behavior, why is everybody in the beer business wasting their money? Of course it influences uh, your behavior, uh, and, uh, and they know it. So, I mean, I would, I would say to them out there, stop peddling trash. Um, use, you know, the golden rule. Do you want your kids to see this? This was the amazing thing to me when I <coughs> got to interview drug dealers, how few of them use the stuff, you know? And when I was out in Hollywood, I talked to people, you know, on the, on the drug stuff, I said, stop showing drug dealers in, in a glamorous light. And they said, fine, we got talking about lousy movies. They said, oh, we never let our kids see the movies. Never, we know what goes into these movies. We wouldn't let our kids see them. 
So just a little bit of the golden rule or Kant's categorical imperative would be, uh, would be helpful here. Uh, turn it off uh, is, I think, the best, uh, the best thing. Well, schools can help, by the way. Um, homework is, uh, is a good thing to do. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there are millions of parents all over this country who have said, why are you watching television? What about your homework? I'm done with my homework. How long did it take? 20 minutes. You want to know the greatest difference in terms of work between the Japanese child and the American child. It's not the school year. That their school year is different, uh, longer. But it's time spent on homework. You look at the homework chart, for the Japanese child and the um, American child, that's where the big difference is. It, they're, they're talking four and five hours a night from puberty on. See, that's, that's the point. Um, when I became Secretary of Education, someone said, if you could wave a wand and uh, do away with one thing, which, uh, in order to improve American education, what would it be? I said, without any hesitation, I said, puberty. Puberty. <laughs> I would get rid of puberty. Anybody, anybody here ever been in a middle school? This is a problem for the human condition. <laughs> However, Western civilization has known this before, and it has figured out things to do with puberty. Keep them busy. Keep them real busy. They do that in Japan, and they have strict rules and laws about drugs and about other things, and their pathology rates are pretty low. Um, sometimes here in America, we surrender to it, uh, and our pathology rate is pretty high. I send, we send our boys to uh, Catholic school. Uh, we would have preferred to send them to public school uh, if we could have found one close by, close by, uh, that, um, <coughs> that we were, had confidence in. There are public schools in this country I'd be delighted to send my children to, where uh, principals are great people I know, uh, teachers are strong and so on, but it, it just didn't exist in our neighborhood, so we sent our children to Catholic schools, and um, they are getting the benefit of, uh, of, the, of the religious beliefs that we, that we share. But that's great, and I want them to get that, but we'll do that too, and we'll do that at church. The best thing about this school is that it's, it's when the boys come home, they spend their time at school running, reading, writing and praying. That's what I want boys to be doing. One of those four things. Running, reading, writing, and praying for as long as possible. <laughs> when they come home, they are tired and they are happy. You know, that's the interesting thing. These are not repressed children, or I should say properly speaking, they are properly repressed children. <laughs> they are happy and most important, they are tired. They are not looking for trouble with us, with the neighbors, with the cat, with anybody else. They are not looking for trouble, and that's the way I want them. Do not surrender uh, to puberty. Uh, the Japanese have basically the Catholic view of puberty. Uh, they do not surrender to it. Uh, they challenge it. And we do not do this to be authoritarian. We do not do this to be curmudgeonly. We do this because we love them. And because if you read your Shakespeare or you read your Bible, you will know that this is the time you got to pay a lot of attention. Not for our sake, uh, but for their sake. And it is interesting, isn't it? When you take the parents out of the equation, uh, it makes it all that much more difficult. So that's what I'd say about television. Yes, sir. Two questions are, uh, <laughs> what about Clinton's health care plan and do you want to use this as a forum to declare your candidacy in 96? And, and if I tried to answer the first one with any degree of expertise, there would be no point uh, in getting to the second one, since I am, since I am not an expert on health care. Uh, let me tell you what strikes me about this. What struck me about this was how, how easily this proposition went down with such a large number of American people and such a large number of Republicans, uh, when people just should have choked on this. I mean, this is not the nose of the camel. This is a fleet of camels. This is the entire camel herd, if you will, uh, coming into your tent. This is big stuff big money, whether you like it or not. This is one-sixth or one-seventh of the economy. It is a major thing. It is bigger than anything Roosevelt uh, proposed in the New Deal. This is big stuff. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm studying it. I'm studying it so as to try to become uh, uh, more, more adept to add it, but I, I'm not going to waste your time going through the details of it, uh, except to say that I don't have any, uh, I don't have any brief for any health care plan that does not in, in some way distinguish responsible from irresponsible behavior. And there are Republican plans that wouldn't do this either. But you have got to send a message every time you put forward a plan from government 
uh, that uh, behavior and responsibility matter and that uh, you cannot keep going back to the same well of misbehavior or uh, 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 self-destructive behavior, uh, which leads to enormously escalating health costs for you and for other people, uh, and do this with impunity. You've got to have that built, uh, built in, because this is the message I think that's being lost uh, the most, that notion of personal responsibility. Um, James Q. Wilson wrote the other day, I think he's right, that the single most important thing that president could do now would be to stand up and talk about uh, several examples of personal responsibility and where it has been attenuated. And I, I will tell you that I think that is exactly right. I think in laying out a welfare reform plan or a crime plan or a, a health care plan, certain premises need to be on the table uh, that the president needs to lay out, uh, whether you're Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative. And every time you get to the podium, uh, every time the person in the Oval Office speaks, they should begin with the same premises. And it goes something like this. Look, first, first thing I want to tell you is you have a responsibility for yourself. Take care of yourself. Exercise some degree of personal responsibility. Second, in terms of the rest of us, I want everybody to listen loud and clear on this. When you have a child, that is the single most important thing you do in your life, okay? You must take responsibility for that child's nurture intellectual, moral, spiritual, physical material. That is your job. If you're trying hard and need some help, we will try to help you. But don't think it is someone else's job. It is your job. Remind yourself of this over and over and over again. You don't want to do it. We will increase the facilities for adoption in this society significantly so that ch families who want children and don't have children can get them. And people who do not want children by their constructive behavior uh, will uh, give, their ch uh, give their children up for adoption. Send that message loudly and clearly, uh, and then proceed with your plans. You know, uh, do no harm. We have, we, have, we have regulations about the environment that say nothing passed in the 83rd Congress can do harm to the environment. Same way for these notions of personal responsibility, the family, the community, uh, and the like. It's a kind of moral zoning, uh, if, you, uh, if you will. To me, um, last point I'd make on this, to me, the problem is, is summed up in the presidential debates last year at, uh, do I have a minute? I have a minute. In Richmond, um, there were the three debates. It was the one at Richmond where the three uh, candidates were there, Perot and Bush and uh, Clinton. And this was the interactive debate, so-called interactive debate. And this, at one point in the debate, this guy came to the podium, about a 45-year-old guy, uh, you may remember him, glasses, ponytail, came to the podium and he said to the three, he said, we are your children. We are your children. What will you do if you're elected president to satisfy our needs? We are your children. I was thinking, this guy's in Richmond, you know, not far from Charlottesville, right? Jefferson, not far from Orange County, Madison. These guys hearing this, we are your children. What will you do to satisfy our needs? Would have said, uh-oh, <laughs> this is a problem. How did this get off track so fast? We are your children. What will you do to satisfy our needs? That was bad. That was discouraging. More discouraging um, were the answers. Bush demurred a little bit, but then gave his list of 12 things he would do to satisfy this guy's needs. Perot got up and said, I'll satisfy your needs, but then he talked about cleaning out the barn and, you know, and uh, <laughs> grandma in the attic, uh, open the hood, and, you know. And, um, everyone was nodding. No one had any idea what he was talking about. Uh, sagebrush aphorisms, you know. Anyway, um, but lively and uh, peppy, the way he is. Uh, and then Clinton got up and sort of embraced the microphone and went on and on, telling this guy what he would do to satisfy his needs. And he's trying, you know, he, he's going to satisfy our needs, our needs for security. And, um, and uh, it was interesting to see his response to it. The response that's deserved to that question is, sir, with all due respect, get a hold of yourself, you know? Um, take, take care of your own needs, you know? Make your contribution to the needs of your family. Supervise your children, uh, you know? Get, get a grip, man, you know? This is the United States of America. You are in charge. You are the sovereign here. You are, you are the sovereign citizenry. We are bureaucrats. All we, are, all we do, we don't run your life. We're just in charge of this, this bureaucracy in Washington. That would have been the response. 
But what would have happened if someone had given that response? What, what, what happened if someone you know, said that to the American people now? They win or lose? I don't know. I think they lose. I think they lose. Because I think people want to be taken care of. And I think they want the government to take care of them. Because they are anxious, because they are insecure. And one understands a lot of the anxiety uh, and, the, uh, and the insecurity. But that, I think, is the heart, uh, that, I think, is the heart of the problem. Uh, what kind of response uh, we make uh, we make to that? Um, Lech Valencia said, uh, back to Western civilization. Lech Valencia knows something about Western civilization. Uh, my view: Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher spoke here before. Lech Valencia has he spoken here? <laughs> you'll you'll get him. Ashbrook Ashbrook gets everybody. So uh, the Pope has he been here? <laughs> They're working on it. They. They had a lot to do with the preservation of Western civilization, particularly in the Soviet Empire. Uh, I love that story about, uh, about the, the Pope, the Polish Pope coming to, to Poland and the s seven million Poles turning out to see him and someone turning to Jaruzelski and saying, there are too many of them. We can't arrest them all, you know, uh, <clears throat> at, the beginning at the beginning of the end of that, uh, of that empire. But like Valenza, you know, toured this country talking about all that and said at the end as he left New York, Statue of Liberty behind him, he said, take care of this country. He said, take care of this country, because if you do not lead us, who will? And that's right. I mean, this country has led the world uh, in the e economic uh, expansion. Uh, it led the world in the achievement of liberty. The lessons of Jefferson are now the lessons of the world. It now has another job to do. It has shown the world that freedom is the indispensable, indispensable ingredient of legitimate government. We now have to show those institutions and uh, things we've been talking about today that we know how to exercise them. Thanks very much. Good to be with you.